The technology that is supposed to keep us safe is lagging behind when we need it the most, when we call 911. No one wants to think business when watching the Avs, but that's exactly what's getting in the way. We pause to honor a man who spent more than half his life serving our community, and then a silent danger took his life. Today's technology can pinpoint you in a split second. That is a great thing until it doesn't work. When seconds count, emergency responders aren't necessarily getting the benefit of that amazing tech. While 911, it is getting smarter, it is still lagging far behind where it could actually be. An while reporting another story, Steve Steger found an example of how the system was causing some problems. South Metro Fire, what's the address of the emergency? August 4th. 2019, a car carrying five people flips on a rural county road near Strasburg. Showing me 58459 East County Road 14. That's the address dispatchers saw on their computer screens. A minute into the call, a witness gives dispatchers a much different address. We're at 5401 Calhoun Byers Road. For the next six minutes. I need you to give me each individual number on its own. It's not coming up like that. The dispatcher struggles. It's five. Four, oh, one. For some reason, it's doing really real things with this address. Trying to pinpoint where the caller is. Can you confirm you're south of I-70 or north of I-70? We're north, north of I-70. Finally, eight minutes in, they realized the caller was spot on. Are you south of 56? Yes. Hey, that 54 one Calhoun's right. And their computer-generated location of the original call was off. It was 16 miles, roughly. Way off. It's 16 miles, it equates to about a 20 minute drive. Um, and so that led to us really wanting to make sure that we were going to the correct location. And Tyler March runs South Metro's dispatch center where the call came in. He says calls like this point to an ongoing issue with 911, especially in rural areas. The misconception to the public is I can order a pizza and I can track my pizza from the minute I place the order to the minute it comes out of the oven to the minute it arrives at my door. The problem is, is that the 911 system isn't based off of GPS. When you call 911, it's, it's based off of cell towers. Though South Metro has tools to combat that. Some smartphones give off GPS data during or immediately after a 911 call, which the dispatcher can use if they search for the phone number on an online database. Still, some carriers don't provide that data. And March admits 911 has a lot of room to grow. I, I do see it getting better. I, I think it's going to take some time, but we're already starting to see those those benefits. For next, we do have them headed to your location. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm Steve Steger. We do want to point out that the people involved in that crash only had some minor injuries. South Metro says Rapid SOS, the company that is providing GPS data to 911 dispatchers, only keeps your location for 10 minutes following a 911 call. When taking the pulse of Colorado's health for the very first time, the Colorado Health Institute asked about unfair and biased treatment. It seems like a really obvious question, but it wasn't asked until now. And guess what? It seems to be a problem for some people. Here's part of our conversation with Jeff Bontrager, who led that survey. About 15% of Coloradans indicated that they had either uh, experienced unfair treatment often or sometimes in their life, and that translates to about 620,000. Were you able to kind of break down what the reasoning was behind that or if there were any patterns to that? What we found was that the most common reasons that were cited had to do with age, um, had to do with race, had to do with gender, and also had to do with income, interestingly. What prompted you guys to add this into the survey? Well, we know that there is a lot of research showing that uh, people may be treated unfairly in a variety of sectors, not just the healthcare sector, but in employment or education or housing based on personal characteristics. So we feel that it's important to ask this question so that we can kind of start a discussion about ways that we can address unfair treatment in our healthcare system. It, it seems like something that maybe should it have been asked before? Yeah. I, I agree with you that um, it, it's maybe late in coming in terms of asking this question. So for a little bit of perspective, this survey is filled out by 10,000 Coloradans, is asking about a whole bunch of things, including insurance, housing, and addiction. Researchers did, however, find out that stress was a big factor when people said that they were dealing with unfair treatments. 
It's a night Colorado Avs fans have been looking forward to, the season opener against the Calgary Flames. But forget the excitement, now they're getting frustrated. They can't watch the game anywhere but Pepsi Center because business got in the way. That's because Altitude Sports is still negotiating a contract between the main television providers, Comcast, Dish, and DirecTV. We asked the same question to ourselves. How did we get here and why are we here? I mean, who wants to talk business and contract negotiations when all you want to do is just watch the Avs game? But here we are talking about not just one, but three contract negotiations. If you ask Altitude Sports, they're going to tell you the big three. They're offering them terms that they say are not viable for their business. That is coming straight from their chief operating officer of the network. But Comcast, Dish and DirecTV are saying that Altitude is demanding too much money for low viewership. So where does that leave fans? Eh, not with a lot of options. There are a handful of smaller cable providers that are carrying altitude. People who do have the big three, though, they are limited to watching the game at Pepsi Center. Tonight, however, the Avs will be playing the game for free on giant screens in the Pepsi Center Plaza outside of the stadium. They do, however, suggest that you should bring your own lawn chairs. Our next question comes from a viewer named John. With the changing seasons, he's noticing a lot of cars driving without their headlights on after the sun goes down. It led him to question Colorado's headlight laws. Well, John, a little education might actually not hurt because it appears some drivers are taking a minute to adjust to what happens every year that it gets darker earlier. But that is not an excuse with the state patrol. Colorado law, it requires drivers to use headlights between sunset and sunrise. There's no particular time on the clock, though, that that's required since, you know, guys, sunset, sunrise, they change. There is a myth, though, that they have to be on a half hour after sunset and a half hour before sunrise. State patrol Patrol says that is not true. Use your common sense, guys. Just avoid a ticket. The fine is $15, two points off your license. Not worth it. So do you have other questions you want us to look into? All you got to do is email us at next at 9news.com or get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. It is Thursday, so tonight we are throwing it back and throwing it way back to 1937. Back then, this beautiful mansion once stood in a place that is very popular today. In fact, the area is Lakewood and it is named after this iconic home. And takers on this one. We are, of course, talking about Belmar. This is the Belmar Mansion that was owned by, uh, by May Bonfies. It sat on 750 acres of farmland west of what is now Wadsworth in Ohio. Bonfies was the daughter of one of the founders of the Denver Post. Historians believe that she chose the name Belmar because it's a combination of her mother's name, Belle, and her name, Mary. The mansion was torn down in 1971. That was nine years after Bonfies passed away. Today, the gates, though, to her mansion, they are still standing. That is where the Iron Gate office building is. We want to pause for a moment to honor Aaron Liebarger. He spent more than half his life serving our community as a firefighter. He passed away at 47 years old. It wasn't the loud and obvious risks that come with firefighting, but a silent one, cancer, that ended his life. West Metro Fire Rescue says it's most likely connected to when he was a part of Colorado Task Force One and went to New York after 9-11. Liebarger was a father, a son, and a husband. He passed away last year. His name has been etched into the history of fallen firefighters in Colorado as a part of an international memorial, and then this Sunday will also be added to the National Fallen Firefighters Memorial. A tattoo they didn't ask for forever on their bodies. And scars will fade. I think the memories will fade a little bit, but I will always remember what is there or what that was for. But new technology is allowing cancer patients to receive their treatment without these permanent reminders. It's a staple in this Colorado community. If you say you're from Idaho Springs, they usually say, oh, that's where the, that's where the field is next to the interstate. Or they say, oh, that's where Bojo's is. But one of these iconic places will soon be no more. And we're not talking about the pizza joint. Plus, something she forgot led to something she'll remember forever. One hiker's kind gesture has a woman ready to pay it forward.
Being a 14er is hard. There is a long list of things you need to make it to the top. We're talking the right clothes, the perseverance, and sometimes just a small act of kindness. Justina Thompson was all ready to scale Mount Bierstadt until she realized that she forgot her gloves. The higher she climbed, you can imagine the colder her hands got, and she said they actually started burning from pain. But then a man named Aaron, who was also hiking, stopped to check on her and then backtracked on the trail to give her his gloves. Justina says she only made it to the top because of him. Oh my gosh, I got to the top and I honestly cried. <laughs> I, didn't, I really didn't think I was going to make it and I made it because of those gloves, I swear. Justina says she only got Aaron's first name and he was long gone by the time she made it back down. She's been posting in 14 or climbing groups on social media. She's just hoping someone may know him so that she can thank him. She knows the chances are pretty low, but is still planning to pay his kindness forward. Yeah, if I could do something for him, just or even pay someone back in return if I'm up on a mountain, like and just give them what I have or something. I mean, just pass on that act of kindness. She is planning to hike another 14er and says she will not be forgetting the gloves next time. Certainly something you have to think about when you are heading up to those 14ers now that the temperatures are really starting to cool off. However, tomorrow it is going to be a warm one, warm and windy. In fact, we're seeing some of the smoke from uh, the Decker fire that is burning across South Central Colorado. Wind speeds picking up in the 20 mile per hour range just to the east of I-25 as well. We do have a fire weather watch in place for us tomorrow for much of the northern and central mountains, foothills for some pretty high wind gusts out there. You'll notice on our future cast some rain moving throughout parts of New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma. Some of this will creep in a little closer to southern Colorado tomorrow. So rain on the way for some this evening. Mostly clear will be down to about 41 a little cooler in northern Colorado 30s up in the high country overall dry until the overnight period into tomorrow morning when that rain begins near the San Juans toward the San Luis Valley. Maybe one or two isolated showers moving across the plains, but I really wouldn't count on much. The big thing you got to keep in mind is the high fire danger, not only for the mountains, but also the far western side of the state as they are under a red flag warning. No warnings for us here in Denver it will be a warm one back to the low 80s 70s across the plains, 60s and 70s up in the mountains will cool off as a cold front rolls through late tomorrow night. So 60s for Saturday and Sunday right now still going to be a bit windy out there, but drier a warm up early next week and then a new show. Ooh, it's getting chilly as we head toward Thursday of next week. Yeah, I stopped at the 80 degrees, I know, but right? I believe you right. are. <laughs> Thanks, Danielle. It is a tattoo that people did not ask for. It is the one that patients get when going through radiation therapy, and it turns into this permanent reminder of what's happened to their body. That is until now. Lori Lizarraga's story, it's starting with the technology, but it's actually about how it gave a little bit of relief for a woman who was facing breast cancer. Radiotherapy tattoos. They're used on cancer patients as a map. So they would get a tattoo on each side of their body and one on the front in reference to what part of their body we're treating. Guiding radiation therapists like Lindsay Escobol to the exact right spot for every round of radiation. To be able to position a patient back into the exact position that they need to be in, um, we have to have some way to get them in that position. They're few and small, but they're there for good. So radiation lasts days to weeks and tattoos are permanent. A fact not lost on radiation oncologist Rebecca Maimani. So we, we have had patients resistant to tattoos, and to, to some people it comes as quite a surprise. So this year, when Anne Marie Scott was diagnosed with breast cancer, she was dreading the little black dot. And to recover from breast cancer, there's a psychological component and there's an emotional component. Anne Marie worried the tattoos would hurt her recovery. And tattoos are by choice and it should be something of value and meaning. And I'm going to look down every day and I'm going to have a constant reminder. So when Dr. Maimani told Anne Marie about a new 3D imaging technology that would eliminate her need for radiotherapy tattoos. And I'm thankful, as silly as it sounds, that I don't have to have just that little bit. She was thankful and it wasn't silly. It was one less obstacle on her way to recovery <laughs> and it helped. I don't want to appear vain about that, um, but not to have that to, to me, it's very personal. Not to have that is very valuable and important. For to next, me. I'm Lori Lizarraga.
It makes a lot of sense. The new technology uses 3D imaging to map the skin surface and then guide radiation treatment. That is, of course, without leaving a permanent mark. It is only available at a few hospitals in Colorado, but Anne Marie is hoping that it will become the standard. Our next couple of home games will be the last two home games um, that we'll have on this field. It's a big part of this Colorado school's history, soon to be just that, history. And this little guy got lost on his way to the Great American Beer Festival. We feel like it's our duty to try to help him out. A football game will be history in the making since it's going to be the la one of the last ones at Gold Digger Stadium. For more than six decades, kids have been playing there for Clear Creek High School. Now their stadium is up for sale, but the memories of the stadium will always belong to those who know it best. All right. We're at Gold Digger Stadium in Idaho Springs, Colorado. Just a little bit left. There you go. Our next couple of home games will be the last two home games that we'll have on this field. So I'll just do one of those numbers. I think a piece of history is going to be coming to an end when this field goes away. I think that it's been in the community so long, started in 1958, first time that we played on it, and it has been a part of the community since that time. It was even voted one of the top 10 places to watch a high school football game at one point. So it's been kind of a community gathering point on Friday nights. I think sometimes people come here more or as much for the social part of it as they do for the football game. And so that's a piece that may be hard to replace. Well, I just think it's generational. You know, I had an uncle that played here on this field when it was first made in 1958 and, and I played on this field and my brother did and my dad and, and I've had a son play on this field. And there's a lot of other families in this community that could say the same thing. Well, I hope as, as it is developed someday that there'll be a way of memorializing the field 
there's got to be a way of having some kind of tribute or memorial to what was here. And then I would just say, I think a lot of alumni are going to show up tomorrow night for this game. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And, and hopefully we can make it a celebration, you know, of what we've had here, those memories. There isn't a buyer yet, so Clear Creek will be playing two more games at Gold Digger Stadium, tomorrow's homecoming game, and then one on November 1st. Next season, the Gold Diggers will be playing at the school's practice field, which will be upgraded. Guidance might be in store for some lost and thirsty souls caught in front of a very familiar beer site. We've got the most Colorado thing we've seen today, plus your feedback. That's next. The most Colorado thing we have seen today is a beer drinker stuck in a rut and a need of a craft beer. The Elk and Evergreen is hanging out near a Budweiser trailer. We get it. It's habit, familiar, comfortable, little watery, but don't get stuck in a rut, little buddy. You can always hydrate with a craft beer with the Great American Beer Festival in town this week, which of course kicked off today. Thank you, Dave, for sending us this photo. That was the most Colorado thing you've seen today. You should always share with us using the hashtag HeyNext or email next at 9news.com. And Jeff, thank you for writing in, asking if Kyle's going to be at GABF. You are right. You also said you deserve a beer. I think I'll go with the glass of wine. We'll see you next time.